Remember Bee Movie? Today we're going to analyze its environmental and philosophical implications. In case you were lucky enough not to see this fever dream inducing abomination when it came out in 2007, Bee Movie follows a honeybee named Barry B. Benson who discovers the human world of honey farming, involves human florist Vanessa Bloom in bee liberation activism, and eventually, well, it suggests that he begins dating her. So they sue the humans, win over honey, the product of bees labor, and the honeybees are, you know, living it up, but they become lazy, stop pollinating, the whole environment goes downhill because the bees have started vacationing. So in the end, the bees decide to cooperate with the humans to keep producing honey and pollinating flowers. Yay. Let's put this spectacular plot to the side for a second and consider what was the goal of the bee movie. I grew up thinking it was environmental protection, but was it really pushing environmentalism? We'll get started by addressing these environmental themes about honey bee conservation in the bee movie. First, let's disrupt the widely conceived notion that saving the honeybees is a prime environmental concern, something Bee Movie propagates to its child audience. Our generation was young when this movie came out, and honeybees have been ingrained in my mind since I was seven as an animal that requires conservation. This status is more questionable than much media has led us to believe. I guess I didn't think that bees not needing to make honey would affect all these other things. It's not just flowers, fruits, vegetables. They all need bees. Well, that's our whole SAT test right there. So, you take away the produce, that affects the entire animal kingdom, and then, of course... The human species? <clears throat> oh. So if there's no more pollination, it could all just go south here, couldn't it? Sorry, but I gotta get going. So unlike this apocalyptic prediction, the environment wouldn't immediately collapse like this without pollination. Mark Dykes, the chief inspector for Texas Apiary Inspection Service, says the majority of our food sources are wind pollinated, meaning the breeze does the work of transporting pollen. Staple North American foods like corn and wheat are wind pollinated and would survive if pollinators stopped pollinating. The diversity of various fruits and nutritional foods rely on pollination though, so it is important but the bee movie did go a little far in showing all of the plants dying all at once and talking about the extinction of the human species. About pollinating animals, there are so many other pollinators that are supremely more important to the environment. Honeybees are not essential. What we commonly think of as a honeybee is Apis mellifera, known as the Western honeybee or the European honeybee. This species has been domesticated for honey production and crop pollination. The only other domestic honeybee, domesticated honeybee in the world is the Eastern honeybee in South Asia. As for the rest of bee species, only seven to 11 species actually produce honey, and there are around 20,000 known species of bee that pollinate plants but don't produce honey. Beyond other kinds of bee, there are also thousands of other pollinator species. According to the US Fish and Wildlife Service, there are insects like wasps, moths, flies, birds, fruit bats, even geckos. In the US, where the bee movie is set, there are about 4,000 native bee species, each with different pollination methods and plant specializations that do not produce honey. And the European bee is not one of them. North America had one native honeybee species, which is now extinct. Current honeybees are actually a non-native species introduced to North America by European settlers to make honey and pollinate crops like almonds, melons, and apples. Honeybees are also bad at what they do. The honeybees we farm, European honeybees, are limited in plant interactions and much less efficient than native bees. Biologists note that in some cases, just over 200 native bees can do the same level of pollination as a whole hive of honeybees containing over 10,000 workers. And native bees are more efficient on a bee for bee basis. Native bees are active for more hours in the day and more days in the year than honeybees. Native bees are safer around humans too. 75 to 90% of native bee species in the US are solitary nesters, which don't live in hives and are less likely to sting because of that. Male native bees don't even have stingers. Honey bees are social nesters and live in a colony so they will sting to protect it. The reason honey bees are so glorified is because they produce honey. We can profit off of them both for honey and pollination because they produce our product and because they're portable for pollination services when people rent out a hive of bees to pollinate their plot of land. 
Native bees aren't portable because they live solitary um, naturally and we can't profit off of them. So emphasizing honeybee conservation doesn't actually do much for the environment. Instead, it helps agricultural industries of pollination and honey production. While there's a difference between introduced and invasive species, honeybees can be invasive to native bees. There's increasing evidence that unnaturally high densities of honeybees from beekeeping populations exacerbates already declining wild pollinator populations, even in Europe, but especially in places where the honeybee has been introduced. Domesticated bees outcompete wild pollinators for resources because of their massive volume and they spread disease faster because humans are transporting them to different areas and that they carry it in an unnatural speed. The sheer number of bees due to agriculture has hurt the environment and will continue to, but we continue to over encourage honeybee conservation instead of native bee conservation because, as the US Geological Survey says, they increase our nation's crop values each year by over $15 billion. From an environmentalist point of view, more attention should be given to important pollinator species, even though they do not perpetuate the honey industry, and even though they do not have activist children's films and poor animation dedicated to them. These are the arguments explaining why the bee movie is not truly pushing for the most efficient environmentalism. So what are they pushing for? One possibility is capitalism. I've found YouTube videos and articles and forums explaining that because everything dies when the proletariat revolution succeeds, in the end they have to go back to class cooperation, showing the downfall of communist systems, and how when the honeybees are freed of their capitalistic bonds, they no longer have an incentive to work, they're spending their time sunbathing, um, Barry's friend gets sad because there's no work to do, and when the factory's up and running again, he feels fulfilled and he's much happier. Sometimes I think, so what if the humans liked our honey? This was my new job. I wanted to do it really well, and now, now I can't. Anybody needs to make a call, now's the time. I got a feeling we'll be working late tonight. <laughs> Thanks for the in-depth fan discussions, Reddit. But a more sympathetic possibility, giving B-Movie the benefit of the doubt, is animal rights. Let's talk about the philosophical distinction between environmentalist movements and animal rights or animal liberation movements. B-Movie amplifies the cause of honeybee liberation and raises ethical questions about whether humans should be exploiting animals and animals' natural labor as a resource. Both weak and strong animal activists argue that humans should not see animals as purely a resource to exploit. I want to focus on two philosophers, though, who address the strong animal rights position. Tom Reagan, who introduced it in his paper, A Radical Egalitarian Case for Animal Rights, and Mary Ann Warren, who published paper, A Difficulty with the Strong Animal Rights Position in Response. Why does his life have any less value than yours? You don't know what he's capable of feeling. Okay, Vanessa, that's enough. Um, Reagan believed in the equal and inherent moral value of animals because they are sentient beings, controversially comparing the fight for animal rights to the women's rights movement and racial and ethnic minority struggles in society, an overall fight for liberation that includes animals. They provide beekeepers for our farms. Beekeeper? I find that to be a very disturbing term, I have to say. I don't imagine you employ any bee freers, do you? And no. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. N no. No, because you don't free bees. You keep bees. He defines it as inherently abolitionist, pushing to abolish all animals as resources, no matter whether they are treated better or worse. If a farm animal is given plenty of space and sunshine, if a lab animal is given um, an adequate amount of anesthesia, no matter how well they are treated, they're still systematically treated as less than and used as a resource. And Reagan believes this is morally wrong. Now for Marianne Warren. Warren believes that just because animals are sentient but not rational does not mean that they are morally equal to sentient non-rational humans. She says that while infants, etc., have moral rights because of our emotional and practical connection to them as part of the human race, um, animals should have moral protections but not inherent moral rights. They don't have the same connection to us and the same moral status. Now, a strong animal rights stance like Tom Reagan's would argue that animals' rights are more important than the environment as a whole when the two concepts conflict. One of Warren's main arguments that I want to focus on um, has to do with the environment as more important than the idea 
of animals' moral rights. She talks about cases of ecologically motivated killing, cases in which it is impossible to protect animal species, habitats, or populations without killing some animals. Examples she brought up are overpopulation of grazers, rabbits reproducing too quickly, situations where a species grazing permanently damages land by allowing erosion, um, or where a species grows so fast that they're at risk of starvation, or when a species, especially an introduced one, causes the extinction of other local plant and animal species or habitats. The strong animal rights position prohibits uh, the violation of any animal's rights and the killing of any animal for population control, or even if they are a predator that kills too many other animals. Warren promotes a weaker animal rights stance that holds that sentient beings should not be hurt or killed without compelling reason, the environment presumably being a good reason. So which one of these views is promoted by B movie? In the first part, I would say definitely, definitely strong animal rights. While the second half of the film tries to argue environmental harmony, the first part is truly pushing for environmental liberation. Humans are exploiting honeybee labor and 100% seeing honeybees as a resource, and Barry has to wage a noble war in court for his species' rights. There are some people in this room who think they can take whatever they want from us because we're the little guys. And what I'm hoping is that after this is all over, you'll see how by taking our honey, you're not only taking away everything we have, but everything we are. Okay, Vanessa. Um, in the second half, B is given for the sake of the environment flourishing, regardless of how wrong this idea is after fact-checking that they need to comply as honeybees for the environment to flourish. This could represent, instead of capitalistic submission, a compromise made for the sake of overall ecology, allowing themselves to be exploited as a resource in order to save the environment, a more utilitarian goal. I disagree that this is a softening of the animal rights stance taken in the beginning of the film because I personally think the bees are depicted as humans given sentient moral equivalence in the end of the movie. They're not putting themselves as a resource so much as fulfilling their inner hardworking capitalistic spirit that really wants to work hard. They're not submitting. It's still portrayed as being for the better where work is good for everyone and it's a win-win and they're not giving up any rights. As a bonus, I want to quickly touch on the personification and sexualization of Barry B. Benson. I think a goal of his extreme personhood as a character in the film is to elevate animals and bees' moral status and rights to that of a human's in the movie. Barry Benson is heavily personified by his pseudo-romantic relationship with the human Vanessa Bloom and his depiction as a talking sentient animal who can communicate with humans. Lots of people think this is weird, um, because it is. Well, hello. Oh, Ken. Hello. Uh, I didn't think you were coming. The Bee Movie also tries to give Barry idealistic traits of being hardworking. In real life, male honeybees don't even make honey or work. All the worker bees are female. Around 10% of bees are male, and male bees hang around eating honey, waiting for the opportunity to mate with the queen. They don't even have stingers. B-Movie tried so hard to create a hardworking male character, and for what? Male mosquitoes don't suck blood either, unlike Barry's mosquito friend. Let's also talk about compound eyes. Barry should not have been sexy. Not saying he was unequivocally sexy, but you know. Would Vanessa Bloom really have gone for these eyes? B-Movie really tried to make us sympathetic to a hardworking male uh, romantic lead when in real life this never ever would have been the case. It makes you wonder if they were pulling at our heartstrings to save the bees regardless of the environment like animal liberation or to save the honey industry uh, like their capitalist theme. In conclusion, the bee movie may not have been a cinematic masterpiece but it holds a place in Gen Z's hearts for its bizarre premises and plot. Now to me bee movie is now a symbol of activism gone uncomfortable and also bite-sized capitalism. But pollinators do need to be protected, regardless of what messaging this movie puts out. From pesticides, climate change, continued human development, like habitat destruction, um, to monoculture, humans all impact pollinator species in very harmful ways, and honeybees' impact is minuscule compared to what our population as a whole does. 
So still save the bees, I guess, but I would argue to do it for the sake of ecological survival and pollination cycles, not for the love of honeybees, not even the love of Barry B. Benson. And let's have a moment of silence for Ken, the true protagonist in this film. Thank you. What are you doing? You know what? I don't even like honey. I don't eat it. And he happens to be the nicest bee I've met in a long time. Long time? What are you talking about? Are there other bugs in your life? This emotional roller coaster. Goodbye, Ken. Oh!